Hey now, welcome to this week's edition of Living Your Hope Live. I'm Joe Olson, so pleased to have you along. As always, I appreciate that you take the time to take this little trip with us every week. Tonight we have a teaching called, Three Places You'll Bump Into God. Later on we're going to have a video by Malin Jones called, Don't You Give Up Now. And in just a little bit we're going to have a new edition of, Growing Your Perspective. As for now, let's bump over to iCheatham and check in on the headlines. Your news, your world, always within reach on KROS. Good evening, I'm iCheatham with KROS News. The world champion tongue twister was arrested today. I understand they're going to give him a tough sentence. More on the story at 11. Wow, sometimes the news leaves me with more questions than answers, but luckily I can always say, Hey Siri! Hello. Hi Siri, how are you? Not too shabby. Thanks for asking. You're welcome. Hey, I got some stuff on my mind. Can I tell you about it? Sure. I like to hold hands at the movies, but it always seems to startle strangers. Hmm. The other day I asked the banker to check my balance, so she pushed me. Gosh. I was raised an only child, which really annoyed my sister. That's what you told me. I have an inferiority complex, but it's not a very good one. Let me just... Siri, why do they give dead people pillows? I don't have an answer for that. I want to die peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather. Not screaming and yelling like the passengers in his car. I don't think you're taking this I was having dinner with the world chess champion, and there was a checkered tablecloth. It took him two hours to pass the salt. I'm sorry. Hey Siri, tell me a joke. My friend is obsessed with taking selfies in the shower. Really? But they always turn out blurry. Why? He has self-esteem issues. <laughs> self-esteem. <laughs> Hey Siri, a grasshopper walks into a bar and the bartender says, Hey, we have a drink named after you. The grasshopper says, Really? In that case, give me a Kyle. If you haven't yet subscribed to this program on YouTube, I want to encourage you to do that. We can always use more subscriptions, push us the show further to more people. That's what we're after. I want to welcome everyone who's meeting with me in the lobby tonight. We're at 7333 East 22nd Street here in Tucson. We meet at 6.30 on Wednesdays. It's an open group. You're welcome to come, be encouraged, hang out with some other believers. If you don't have a church and you're local here to Tucson, Living Hope Family Church is at the same address, 7333 East 22nd Street, and we meet Sunday mornings at 10.30. We'd love to have you and your family come join us for that. So, uh, you ready to up your fashion game? We're not trying to say that living your hope live apparel and swag is rock and roll. Everyone else is saying it for us. See the link below and start rocking today. Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, growing your perspective. Welcome to Growing Your Perspective, where we look at the issues that matter to you. I am a proud Arizonan. I believe we have one of the richest histories in all of America here in the Southwest. There are so many museums and places you can visit to find out more about Arizona's history. Places like the Arizona Sonoran Desert Museum, the Arizona Preservation Society. Probably my personal favorite is on the U of A campus, the Arizona History Museum. And today we have a very special guest to walk us through some of Arizona 
Arizona's history, and he is so qualified to do that. This is the president of the Arizona Historical Society. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Professor Herber Stem. Professor, I'm glad you have me here. I'm glad you have me here because I got uh -huh. a message. I just saw one. I saw a UFO. They're coming to get us. They're everywhere. UFO. You see it? Oh, All that increase. They're here. Did you ever see the Twilight Zone episode? Uh -huh. How to serve humans? That's what they're doing. Uh -huh. They're coming for us. We're in trouble. I gotta get they're Frank, everywhere. The UFOs Frank, are everywhere. Frank, what is this? I tell you something. This they're is the president of the historical society. society. No, this guy's from the hysterical society. Hysterical? I didn't want the hysterical society. I didn't want the historical society. What am I supposed to do with this guy? He was available. He is hysterical. We're doomed. We're doomed. Great job, Frank. Let's open the word. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why am I here? Why am I following Jesus? It's actually a really good question. The chances are that if you've been serving God for any length of time, the answer to that question has changed over time. I want to look at some snapshots in the life of Peter and see if we can glean some insight into our own motivations for serving God. And on that journey, we're going to see three places where you're likely to bump into God. Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gisenaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land, and sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats, so that they began to sink. When Simon saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, from now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. I want to begin tonight by looking at the first calling of Peter. Peter's a lot like you and I in that most of us initially follow Jesus for purely self-motivated reasons. Thing is, God knows a lot more about our business than even we do. Jesus, here he is, he gets into Peter's boat, he's uninvited, he climbs in and begins to teach the, the multitudes. Jesus then tells Peter, hey, let down your nets and you're going to catch a bunch of fish. Now, Peter and company, they have already cleaned their nets. That's not some small amount of work. They've sat there, they've done their work, they know their job, and God has no problem with interrupting our routine with his call for our lives. Peter's taken back a bit. He's like, you know, Jesus, you're, you're good at telling all your little stories and all, but I'm kind of the fisherman here. Peter's not entirely sold, but you know, here's this famous guy in his boat. Everyone's watching. He's like, you know what? You know, let's humor this guy. Throw down the nets, guys. And you know, we live our day-to-day -day lives like, you know, hey, I got this, but God wants to prove himself right where we live. A lot of times it seems like we're just kind of humoring God, you know? We act like our soul is some sort of a bargaining chip that we have to play. God has already purchased us with a price. Now, Peter has already heard Jesus preach and teach. But all the math changed for Peter when he saw that God could invade the space where he himself actually lived his life. People can attend church and hear all about the miracles in the Bible. No big deal. But when God attends their life and manifests himself where they live, that's when they're converted. Peter has a revelation. He's awed by who Jesus is. And then a very interesting thing happens. Peter becomes self-aware. He drops to his knees. It says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. When God calls us, he not only gives us a revelation of who he is, he gives us a revelation of who we are. 
This is exactly what happened to me when I became a Christian. I, God came and he opened my eyes to who I really was. It was like the lights came on and I could no longer hide. Now, when I was a little kid, there was this public service announcement that would come on every day uh, during the children's television hour and it freaked me out as a little kid. It went something like this. I remember a public service announcement that showed a woman walking down the sidewalk. She was kind of stooped over, dressed in ratty clothes and looking a little lost. She walked down the sidewalk till she came to a walkway up to a house. She turned and walked up to the front door and knocked. When the door opened, it was the same woman. Only now she was dressed in nice clothes, had makeup on, and the announcer asked, Is it ever you at the door? I have no idea what the real public service announcement was about, but it freaked me out as a kid. I figured one day I was going to open the door and there I would be. And that's exactly what happened when I was confronted with the gospel. It was like suddenly I saw myself for who I really was, that I was broken and I was wrecked. I became self-aware. The same thing happened in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 5. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Our initial encounter with who God is makes us keenly aware of who we are. I've thought a lot over the years about what it is that motivates people to come to Christ and get saved. Advertisers have discovered two principal motivators in us human beings. Number one, the fear of punishment. Number two, the hope of reward. I got saved initially because I didn't want to go to hell. Uh, it seems like a pretty good reason to me. It is a good reason, at least to start with. Also, he's God. We're not. And suddenly to realize that God is real and that he is accessible to our lives certainly deserves a closer look, wouldn't you say? Peter is now a follower of Christ. He has become aware that God is real and that he is really sinful. Peter is following, but he's following for his own reasons. This is common to almost everyone that I've met and that I've seen. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. Sin makes me unhappy, and I want to be happy. Our calling to follow Jesus is all theoretical until we walk it out in real life. A young woman wanted to go to college, but her heart sank when she read the question on the application blank that asked, Are you a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she wrote, no, and returned the application expecting the worst. To her surprise, she received this letter from the college. Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that they have at least one follower. Let's talk secondly about a three-year walk. Peter walked with Jesus for three years, and if our reasons for following Christ are ever going to grow and to mature, we're going to have to bump into God in three different places, and we see all three of these happen to Peter. Let's talk about those. The first one I want to look at is a walk in the miraculous. Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 through 32. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid, and beginning sinking, he cried out, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got back into the boat, the wind ceased. 
Man, it is especially fun to watch the life of a brand new believer because God shows up to them in so many ways to make himself known. I mean, when they begin to hear God speak in their own life, it's a powerful thing. To come to a belief that there is a living God is to embrace something beyond our natural senses. Being a Christian is a supernatural act. Without Jesus, we sink. An alcoholic became a believer and was asked how he could possibly believe all the nonsense in the Bible about miracles. You don't believe that Jesus changed the water into wine, do you? I sure do, because in our house, Jesus changed the whiskey into furniture. God proves himself to us in uniquely personal ways. I remember as a new believer, I had this wart on one of my fingers on my guitar playing hand. And every time I played, this thing would catch on the strings and it would bleed and it was just irritating me. And one day I was praying and I just started kind of whining about my life to God. And, and in the midst of that, and I said, and this wart on my hand, it's really a pain in the butt and I hate this. And within two days, it dried up and it disappeared. Let me tell you something. I was on my knees saying, God, I am a sinful man because the revelation of a supernatural God just struck me and I can't tell you how many ways and places I've seen God move supernaturally in my life. God is not afraid to prove himself to anyone who comes to him with a repentant heart. We need these experiences. We need to bump into God in the place of the supernatural, in the place of the miraculous. We need to walk through things that are absolutely impossible without God's supernatural power. Probably more important than seeing God in the miraculous is the ability to bump into him in the mundane. We need a God for the mundane, for the day-to-day -day business of life. Peter's been following Jesus for a while now, but he's still trying to carry things. You know, hey, I got this. We tend to be so compartmentalized in our life, don't we? There are the spiritual things that we discuss with God, and then there's the rest of our daily routine that we tend to try to leave him out of. And you notice that when Peter was called by Jesus, Jesus broke into the daily routine of Peter's fishing day. Look at this example of how Peter tries to handle the mundane day-to-day -day things without God, but God wants to bump into us right there. Matthew chapter 17, verses 24 through 27. When they had come to Capernaum, those who received the temple tax came to Peter and said, Does your teacher not pay the temple tax? He said, Uh, yes. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him, saying, What do you think, Simon? For whom do the kings of this earth take customs or taxes, from their sons or from strangers? Peter said to him, From strangers. Jesus said to him, Then the sons are free. Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you have opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and you. This account really cracks me up. Here's Peter. He's questioned in the temple about a tax that's supposed to be paid by out-of-town worshipers. And he says, Oh, uh, yeah, of course we paid that even though they hadn't. And he goes off with this whole thing weighing on his mind. And when he walks in, the Bible says there, Jesus anticipated him. He was waiting at the door to help Peter through this moment. If Jesus is only available to us for those big miraculous moments, we're not going to see all that much of him, are we? God is concerned about every mundane moment and detail of our lives. Our understanding of our calling in God will never be complete until we learn to see God in the mundane and share those aspects of our life with him as well as our spiritual moments. Take some time and read Luke chapter 24. You got two discouraged disciples walking down the road to Emmaus. They're not looking for God in that moment, and yet God meets them there and turns them back around. We need to walk and bump into God in the moment of the mundane. It's the stuff that most of life is made out of. There's one other place where we need to bump into God, and that's when we walk through our moments of failure. Matthew chapter 6, verses 73 through 75. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are also one of them, for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Peter is utterly and completely humbled by his failure. We expect to find God in the miraculous. We're delighted to find God in the mundane, but we're actually surprised to find him in our failures. We tend to think God deserts us and distances himself from us in our moments of failure. 
Oh, uh, ew. Okay, uh, I'm gonna just go on over there. When you get yourself cleaned up, we'll, uh, yeah, okay, I gotta go. Bye. But that's not how God handles it all. Peter is so shocked by his own failure, he's ready to check out on this whole following Jesus discipleship program. He goes back to fishing, back to where Jesus found him. An angel sends him a message from the empty tomb after Jesus is risen. Mark chapter 16, verse 7, But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. Think this through. Jesus left heaven, took on human flesh, and came to this world. He came directly to the site of our sin and our failure and sacrificed himself right there. He came to ground zero of our failure. God does not shy away from our failures. He walks through them with us and redeems us. The place of our failure is actually one of the most receptive places we have. We tend to listen more and talk less. If we don't learn to walk with God through the place of our failure, we're not going to walk with him very far. Our calling is not tested until we bump into God in the place of our failure. Let's finish up tonight by talking about the second calling of Peter. After three years of walking out his faith, Peter is ready to follow for some different reasons. And likewise, our reasons for following Jesus must grow. They must mature. They must change. After his failure, Peter goes fishing and a familiar scene kind of plays out. They toil all night. They catch nothing. Jesus is on the shore and yells to them to cast the net out on the other side of the boat. And they catch so many fish they begin to sink. Peter realizes, hey, that's Jesus. He dives in, swims to shore, and has another life-changing conversation. John chapter 21 verses 15 through 19. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. Jesus gives Peter the same calling, follow me, but now it's going to happen for some new reasons. God is just as interested in my motives as he is in my actions. God is always working to perfect our faith, to take us to a new level of maturity and understanding. Our calling must move beyond those original selfish motives if we're going to be sustained for the long haul. Three times Jesus asks Peter, do you love me? And three times he tells him, feed my sheep. We can't separate following Jesus from loving his people. I can't truly speak into another person's life until I've also walked with them through some of the stuff of life. Now Peter is going to be able to get past himself and past his failure because he's bumped into God. He's bumped into God in the miraculous. He's bumped into God in the mundane. He's bumped into God in the midst of his own failures. And because he's done this, it's not, he hasn't so improved himself, But because he's bumped into God in those places, he's realized just how good God is and that he can depend on him. Once we've walked with Jesus through the stuff of life, we should come to two conclusions. Number one, I can't do this without God. And number two, God's got my business and my life well in hand. I should be about his business tending to those sheep. During their conversation, Jesus says to Peter, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Jesus gives Peter a much more focused calling. Feed my sheep. It's not just about who or what you are anymore, Pete. In his first calling, Peter became self-aware. In this second calling, he is made to be others aware. To serve God for his purposes instead of our own, we're going to have to turn this corner of others. 
If we read through the Gospels, we'll see that Jesus had been leading Peter and all of his disciples towards this the entire time. He's always been trying to get them to take their eyes off themselves. John chapter 4, verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. We need to look around ourselves tonight. There is crying need and opportunity everywhere around us if we're willing to take our eyes off of ourselves and begin to look at others. It's time that we stop spending our Christian life worrying about ourselves. God can take care of you and I. We need to take care of others. Like Peter, most everyone starts following Christ out of self-interest. But over time, God wants to bump into us. He wants to bump into us in the miraculous. He wants to bump into us in the mundane and even in the moments of our own failure. And in those moments, we discover that God is faithful and dependable and that we are in good hands. We all need to eventually turn the corner of others and follow Christ motivated by something more than just ourselves. Feed my sheep. What does that mean? It means take care of others. As you're watching this tonight, perhaps you don't know Jesus Christ. You've never come into a personal relationship with God. God is more than willing to prove himself to you if you will come to him on his terms, which is simple repentance. I'm going to say a prayer tonight. I believe if you will agree with me as I pray this prayer, God will honor that. Lord, we come to you and we thank you, Lord, that you were willing to die for us while we were sinners. You came to the place of humanity's failure and sin, and you sacrificed yourself in that spot so that we could be saved. Lord, tonight we confess that we're sinners, and we ask you, Lord, to forgive us, to come into our heart, to come into our life, and make us new. Lord, we want to know you from this day forward. Lord, we acknowledge that you died and that you rose again and that, God, we need that life to be in us, God. I thank you and I ask you tonight that we would know you from this day forward. In the name of Jesus, amen. Christian, don't ever be afraid to continue to discover God. Discover him in the miraculous. Discover him in the mundane. Discover him in the moments of failure. And let's follow Jesus for the sake of others. Let's serve God together. We're big fans of this local young man named Malin Jones on this show. He's out doing a work for the Lord. He comes up with some pretty cool tunes as well. And this one tonight is called, Don't You Give Up. Don't you give up now. Don't you give up now. Don't you give up. Don't you give up now. Don't you give up now. Don't you give up. We live in the cold, cold world. With many scarred boys and girls So many broken dreams That turn into nightmares I am one of them And you are probably one of them too But if we come together We can make dreams come true And I know Your heart is broken And I know Mine is too but I know we're not forsaken And I know we're about to break through So don't you give up now, don't you give up now Don't you give up now, don't you give up Hey, Don't you give up now, don't you give up now Don't you give up now, don't you give up Don't you give up now, don't you give up now Don't you give up now, don't you give up Don't you give up now, don't you give up so many broken hearts Wandering in the dark I'm just trying to be a light Instead of cursing the dark But Father, Father, Father We need some healing from above Oh, 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 oh. And I know Your heart is broken See, mine is too But I know We're not forsaken And I know We're about to break through So don't give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Come on Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Now, 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 don't you give up You're gonna see 
a brighter days And all that pain will go away Yeah, yeah, yeah Trust in Jesus and have faith Yeah, yeah, yeah Cause he already made a way Do you believe? So don't give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now Don't you give up now Don't you give up Don't you give up now, don't you give up now, don't you give up, let's go So let me ask you tonight, is it ever you at the door? Live in your hope this week. God bless you. We'll see you soon. Just set aside the ugh, curator of that plate. Arizona, the Arizona Historical Society. I have uh, uh, Arizona histo History Me. We have such a rich. A rich. A rich. President. Professor. S Welcome. President. History Museum himself did that uh, did you just beep again turn your phone off Professor Herberst uh, of the history of the Arizona through a walk through Ari <sighs> that this is a professor da -da. Yeah, yeah that was the perfect one that was the one I wasn't gonna screw up <laughs> Hey now.